Hi, I'm Benjamin King with Rain for Rent. I've been with Rain for Rent for the last 11 years, and I've been an engineer for the last 15 years. I'm going to be delivering a webinar where you'll learn the basics of bypass planning and system design. Sewage is a hazardous waste and not something you want to leave to chance when doing a project. Demonstrating your ability to keep the public safe and prevent spills and costly fines will put you as the clear choice above your competition. Sign up for a time below and I'll see you there. Hello, this is Benjamin King with Rainfront Engineering. Today we're going to talk about bypass pumping, namely sewer bypass pumping. We'll review terms and definitions that you should know. We'll go over some project planning and execution steps. We'll review some actual projects. We'll discuss some potential issues. And lastly, we'll, re and lastly, we'll review some safety concerns and procedures. Flow, unit of volume per unit of time is probably the most important item when designing a bypass. Typically it's measured in gallons per minute or MGD, million gallons per day. One MGD is the equivalent of 694 gallons per minute. Pressure, force per unit of area, is typically measured in PSI. Head pressure, or simply head, is the pressure at the base of a column of fluid. It's typically measured in foot of water, or foot for short, and 2.31 feet is equivalent to 1 PSI. Now the column of water doesn't matter if it's 4 inches wide, 4 feet wide, a mile wide, it has to do with the vertical height of the water. Prime charge of liquid required to begin pumping when the material is below the pump or lower than the pump. Self-priming pumps are a pump that can draw material up from below the pump inlet. A drive prime pump is a pump that can draw material up from below the inlet without any external assistance. A contractor pump would be an example of a self-prime pump. It can draw fluid from below it, but you need to first fill the volute with water manually or through some other way. However, with a drive prime pump, you can put the suction hose in, turn the pump on, and the pump will prime itself. Vapor pressure is the required pressure at a specific temperature to prevent material from vaporizing. For example, the vapor pressure of water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit is 14.7 PSI. That means it takes 14.7 PSI to keep water water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Consequently, that's why water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Static head is the vertical height difference between two points. Suction lift is the vertical distance from the impeller eye to the surface of the material to be pumped. Since grade to impeller won't be known until the pump is actually selected, this is often reported as fluid level to grade. It's important to keep that in mind. Friction loss is the amount of pressure required to pump material through piping, valves, fittings, hose, etc. at a given rate of flow. Total suction lift is the suction lift or static suction lift plus the vapor pressure plus all suction line friction losses. Total dynamic head is the total performance required by the pump. It is total suction lift plus static head plus all the discharge friction losses plus all the discharge pressure requirements. An example of a discharge pressure requirement would be pumping into a force main or pumping into a tank. This is a graphic re representation of the items we just talked about or some of the items we just talked about. You can see we have in the upper left hand corner suction lift to grade. Uh, we have how much pipe or hose will be needed to be installed to reach the fluid. Uh, we have the discharge length. We have the difference uh, between the suction and the discharge, or more correctly, the elevation change over the discharge length. And lastly, we have whether or not the discharge is open. An open discharge would be you're open to atmosphere, meaning there's no required pressure at the end of it. A closed discharge, or a non-open discharge, would mean the system is required to perform at a particular pressure at the end of the temporary system, i.e. a force main. Peak flow 
is the maximum flow that will go through a line or the maximum flow that a system needs to be capable of performing at. Uh, typically it's measured in MGD or gallons per minute. Uh, along with suction lift, it's the most critical piece of information, information necessary for pump sizing. Uh, and it can be calculated either manually or using various apps that are available in the market. It also can be measured. Project planning and execution. The first thing that needs to be agreed upon is the different responsibilities between the customer, the owner, the subcontractor, etc. Before any work starts, these responsibilities are going to need to be determined and agreed to in writing. Uh, in, order to, in order to achieve a successful bypass, all parties should take time to outline responsibilities such as setup deadlines, pump watch, fueling of pumps if, if applicable, uh, system installation, system installation concerns, uh, essentially the scope of the project. One of the items that's important to address sooner rather than later is who's responsible for setting the plug. Uh, the plug is a device that blocks the sewer line and enables uh, a temporary bypass. Uh, clearly determining who, uh, who's responsible and whose scope of work plug setting will fall under is imperative before any work starts. Uh, any safety issues or confined space issues should also be addressed at this time. If the temporary bypass system requires a high level of surcharge, you should consider, consider uh, a double plug setup. Uh, also, uh, in regards to restraining the plug, it's important to consider what structure you'll be utilizing because it needs to be a permanent structure or a very solid temporary structure. Securing a plug to a pickup truck or a piece of mobile equipment uh, is not safe and should never be done. Uh, Rain for Rent does not self-perform uh, any plug setting work. Flow rates. If peak flow is unknown, it can be estimated using the right flow flow app. Uh, however, keep in mind this is just a snapshot at that point in time. It's not a full flow analysis. The information that you'll need to gather in order to use the right flow flow app are as follows. Uh, slope of the gravity main. How full of it? How full is it? Uh, typically that's in uh, quarter pipe increments. Uh, what is the material composition of the pipeline? Is it RCP? Is it HDPE? Um, also it's age. Age is important to determine the hydraulic roughness. Uh, age will also affect the end value. Uh, the information that needs to be gathered to utilize the right flow app is the slope of the gravity main, how full it is, and what the material is, what it's made out of. Is it RCP? Is it HDPE? Um, age is also a factor in determining the end value or the hydraulic roughness. Uh, however, the app uses a conservative end value, so you should be uh, pretty, pretty safe there. The Right Flow Calculator is a free app for both Android and Apple products. Once it is installed on your device, you can click on the frictional loss flow calculator, uh, enter the items that we discussed previously, and it gives you uh, a maximum, minimum, and mean flow for the gravity system. Force mains versus gravity mains. A force main is a pressurized pipeline. Uh, for example, if you have to pump sewage up a hill or up a mountain, uh, or if you're just lifting it as a lift station and then putting it into a force main that becomes a gravity main later on. A gravity main is a gently sloping pipeline that moves sewage downhill. That's really the only difference between a force main and a gravity main. Is a force main is under pressure, a gravity main is open to the atmosphere and functions due to gravity. Why this is important is we need to know what needs to happen at the end of the discharge. Are we dumping into a gravity main where it just continues to roll downhill? Or are we pump pumping into a force main in which we need to overcome some sort of pressure? 
space constraints in projects is a very real issue that needs to be addressed or dealt with often. Uh, also, things like accessibility. Uh, how much space do we really have to install this equipment and install our, our system? Uh, noise pollution is also becoming a bigger and bigger issue in residential areas as well as in industrial areas. The bottom line is you need to know your site. Um, things like, is surcharge in the manhole possible? If so, how many feet? Surcharge is simply letting the manhole back up or how much you can let the sewer back up before it causes issues. Uh, what's the discharge distance? What's the discharge pipeline? Will it interfere with any other items or any other work? Uh, what's the change in elevation from where your pumps are going to sit to your discharge point? What's the suction lift? Available space at the suction point. Can the cone be pulled if the manhole is too small? How big is the manhole? How big is the suction structure? Are more manholes or different manholes available if one's not big enough? The more detail you have in your pre-project planning, the more detail you have in your site review, the more accurate and the better temporary bypass system you'll be able to design. We reviewed this just before when we were talking about terms and definitions. This is a good place to record the information about the project site. The most important item is what is the peak flow. Uh, the second most, what is the suction lift? Fluid level to grade. The other items we've discussed, length of discharge, elevation distance between the pumping point and the discharge point, or the elevation change over the discharge run, uh, what needs to happen at the discharge point, these are all items that once known will be used to design your system. Bypass system design. Now, pump selection is based on these variables. Flow, TDH of the entire pumping system, including all external factors, net positive suction head conditions, availability of power source, or what power is available or needed, and noise considerations. A centrifugal trash pump is designed to pump fluids with solids in it. Uh, it can be a diesel engine or electric motor configurations, and they are also available in sound attenuated configurations. A submersible trash pump uh, is typically used when there's uh, high suction lift bypass pumping requirements or space and access requirements. Um, usually they are three phase 460 volt electric motors. Some of the things to keep in mind when using a submersible pump, especially a submersible electric pump, is where power will come from. Will it be a generator? Is there a permanent power source? If there's a permanent power source, what's needed in regards to backup power. Uh, submersible pumps are also available in hydraulic uh, drive units. Uh, the hydraulic drive units can be equipped with biodegradable hydraulic fluids. When considering your power source, you need to keep in mind a few items. Number one, the duration of the project. How long is it going to be? This will determine whether the cost of the diesel versus the cost of the electric power which one's more economical? Uh, space constraints are also a concern when determining a power source and any and all environmental concerns. Typically speaking, if power is already available, it can be more economical to use electrical power for the bypass. However, if time constraints are in place, sometimes it's not feasible to wait for uh, a, a power drop, even a temporary power drop, to be established before you start your uh, start your system up. In cases where the suction lift is too great to be handled by centrifugal pumps, one of the items that can be done, or one of the meth construction methods that can be incorporated, is benching down. Uh, essentially, this is just digging a hole and moving your pumps closer to the fluid. So think of it this way. Benching down is moving your pumps closer to your fluid. Surcharge is moving your fluid closer to your pumps. Regardless of which method is employed, you are decreasing your suction lift and increasing your net positive suction head available. Some things to keep in mind. There are situations where you use multiple pumps in one manhole. 
However, as the picture indicates, depending on how many pumps and how close their suction stickers are, you may need to derate the pumps. The performance of the pumps won't be the same or will not meet the curves just because the suction stingers are so close to one another, the pumps fight. Uh, there's no standard way to predict how much performance decrease will come from having your suction stingers very close. In situations where multiple suction stingers are in close proximity to one another, engineers should be consulted for the project design. Pipe and hose selection. You have several options when it comes to deciding what pipe and hose to use for a system. Um, standard sized hoses in most rental fleets run from 2 inches to 12 inches. Uh, Rainfront standard aluminum pipe comes from 4 inches to 12 inches. Uh, we also have 4 inch to 12 inch steel pipe. Uh, HDPE ranges from 4 inches to 30 inches. And we also have 36 and larger size pipe available in the rental fleet. Aluminum pipe uh, is a self-restrained zero leak connection. It is very light, handles high pressure, uh, and is quickly installed. High density polyethylene pipe, HDPE, is very durable. Uh, it is a fused connection process. So essentially once the pipe is fused correctly together it's one long piece of pipe. Uh, various sizes highly durable and essentially chemically inert. Uh, discharge manifolding and valve placements important to consider as well. You want to be able to isolate each pump. Uh, you also want to be able to sometimes put multiple pumps into multiple lines. The right flow app can be used to determine total dynamic head. Total dynamic head can be used with flow to establish the duty point. Now, if we plot the duty point for this particular system on the DB200C pump curve, we can see that not only do we fall within the recommended operating range, we also are at an efficient point on the pump curve. Uh, we have a net positive suction head requirement of 8 feet, and we have more pump left in case there's a problem with the system or in case more flow is required. When sizing a pump or when selecting a pump to power a particular system, you want to make sure you remain in the recommended operating range. Too far to the left or too far to the right will cause damage to the system and may even cause a failure of the system. It's also very hard on the pump. Redundancy, or essentially having a backup plan. Pumps are mechanical pieces of equipment. Mechanical pieces of equipment can, can fail. Uh, also, having a backup pump or backup plan allows routine service to be also having a backup pump or a backup plan allows routine service of the primary pumps. It also allows deragging operations of the primary pumps. And lastly, it helps to give a safety net in the event that peak flows were miscalculated or underestimated. This is an example of a typical pump layout. You can see the suction line coming from the manhole into the pump. You can see the pump sitting on traction mats and the traction mats and pump within a spill guard. Traction mats are used for footing and to maintain a stable surface for or a stable and safe surface for our workers. The traction mats are used to maintain footing in a safe work environment. The spill guard is used for secondary containment on the mechanical piece of equipment. Uh, you can also see underneath the spill guard, you can also see along the discharge pipeline pipe stacks to stabilize the pipe as well as a road crossing to maintain access. Now, you'll have to excuse the cartoon drawing, but it gives you an idea of how a setup or a two pump setup should be done. You have your primary pump and your backup pump. Both have independent suction lines. Both pumps are manifolded with isolation valves into a common discharge. The common discharge line goes to a single open open discharge point. The isolation valves allow each pump to be separated from the system, for example in case of maintenance or deragging operations, things of that nature. Post bypass cleanup. 
Some of the things to keep in mind when shutting a system down are to make sure the plugs have been removed prior to shutting down the pumps, uh, properly drain and sanitize the pumps and pipelines prior to breaking down. Uh, it's important to consider in regards to properly draining and sanitizing the pumps what regulations will govern your project. Can chlorine be used? Can chlorine be discharged directly into the manholes? Uh, things of that nature. It's important to check pressure readings on the system to ensure everything has been properly depressurized before the equipment is broken down. This particular project was 120 MGD bypass, a fairly large bypass. Uh, we were able to use independent suction lines. As you can see, the pump pad had to be benched down to enable the suction lift to be in range of what the pumps could operate at. The pumps were then manifolded together into multiple discharge lines with isolation valves on each pump and isolation valves on each discharge line. This particular project uh, had noise constraints. On the other side of the river, because there's rivers there, there's the manhole there, a uh, river where the trees are, there, and then a housing development on the far side. Uh, the people were concerned and the owners were concerned of the noise of the bypass, the noise of the pumps. Consequently, we used hay bales to block and distribute the sound. In the upper right hand corner, you can see a small lateral uh, that was further down the line that needed to be picked up and included into this 86 MGD bypass. Uh, the lateral was far enough away from the houses that no sound attenuation uh, was required. This particular bypass, this 63 MGD bypass, needed to be conducted because there was a failed sewer gate. Uh, we were able to come in, uh, review the project, do the design, and mobilize the pumps and equipment to install to ensure there was not a spill uh, when the sewer gate failed. Some potential issues that may occur in a sewer bypass. One potential issue or problem is if the system deadheads. What that means is the pumps have power and they're working, but there's no net flow or no fluid is moving. Uh, one of the causes for this could be a closed valve on the discharge side, either a closed valve in the temporary system or a closed valve in the permanent system that we're pumping into. Uh, another reason could be the pressure of the force main is greater than anticipated if we're pumping into a force main. This could also be caused by a blockage in the discharge pipeline. Uh, if the fluid remains in the pump and the impeller continues to move, the fluid will start to be heated and it will heat to the point that it boils and it can cause the, the pump to explode. Pump watch services can help mitigate this issue, meaning if your pump watch is being conducted correctly, you're able to see this before it becomes a problem and correct it. If the low velocity is too low, solids settle out. And it's hard to tell from the picture, but you can see the pipe essentially full of gunk uh, from the flow velocity being too low and solids settling out into the pipe up into the point of clogging the pipe. Now, cavitation, centrifugal pumps are designed for a certain flow range at a particular set of criteria. If there's not enough net positive suction head available, empty space forms, causing reduced performance and potential major damage. Now, this empty space is essentially little goblets of, of, of vapor or little goblets of gas. The empty space is essentially air bubbles. Some common causes for cavitation are an incorrect pump, an incorrect pump design. Uh, the suction lift is too great for the pump. The suction inlet or strainer or pipe has been collapsed, blocked, or obstructed in some way. Or the impeller is excessively worn. Cavitation can cause significant damage to the impeller, backplate, and casing. And it can cause complete system failure. Exposing your project to cavitation problems through improper calculations, wrong selection of pump, and poor monitoring can lead to very high repair bills 
and can also lead to complete system failure. Complete system failure gives us sewage spills or, or sanitary sewer overflows. A sanitary sewer overflow can be caused by the bypass not being properly designed, the bypass not being properly maintained or operated. Uh, it can also be caused by the actual flows being higher than anticipated. Storms or other incidents can cause an increase in flow. Large objects and or ragging causing pump blockage can also cause a, an overflow or spill. Spills can result in delayed projects, fines, and unnecessary cleanup fees. Some of the things to keep in mind when dealing with safety. Uh, first and foremost, a job safety analysis, JSA, should be conducted. It should be conducted prior to the start of the job. Uh, it should identify safety concerns and hazards. It should provide a plan for dealing with hazards. Uh, and it should be utilized to create a job specific safety plan. This is an example of a rain for rent JSA. We have the category of tasks being conducted. We have the department in charge. We have who created it, uh, the task being performed, uh, the general safety hazards, the specific site safety hazards, the specific task safety hazards. We also have the recommended safety precautions to eliminate the identified hazards. Lastly, we have a sign-in so that everybody in the area and everybody conducting the work can indicate that they've reviewed the JSA, they agree with the mitigation steps for the hazards, and they are agreeing to abide by the safety plan established by the JSA. Some of the common bypass pumping job site safety hazards are traffic. Uncovered, exposed manholes and wet wells, fall hazards. Uh, temporary piping. Temporary piping, if not uh, temporary piping, which could pose a trip hazard. Uh, exposed sewer. Uh, pressurized systems and equipment. Pinch points. Moving machinery. Installation of these systems could also pose physical hazards, such as a back injury or slips, trips, and falls things of that nature. Slip trips and falls make up the majority of general industry accidents. 15% of all accidental deaths, second leading cause of behind motor vehicles is slip trips and falls. It is one of the most frequently reported injuries. Uh, slip trips and falls account for 25% of reported claims in a year. And over 17% of all disabling occupational injuries result from falls. As you can see from the pictures on the right, a little bit of housekeeping goes a long ways to help mitigating slips, trips, and falls. Rain for Rent has a variety of products to be utilized for this, including pipe stacks, hose tracks, and things of that nature to help keep your job site organized and safe. For more information, please contact Rain for Rent at www.rainforrent.com. Now, we've reviewed and went over a lot of stuff. Some of the information might be new. Some of it might be stuff you already are aware of and got a good handle on. But I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So, at this time, we'd like to open the floor.